Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hello, my name is Scott Sorrell. Uh, I'll be your host today for today's conversation. We are at the uh, 55th World Dairy Expo today, and we've just gotten done watching a virtual farm tour of the Bateman Mesita Dairy Farm in uh, Mesita, uh, Utah. And with me today, I've got three brothers from the, uh, uh, from the dairy, uh, Brad Bateman, Steve Bateman, and Jason Bateman. So gentlemen, what I'd like to do is start off is, uh, and Brad, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna ask you to kind of introduce yourself and kind of talk a little about, a bit about your role with the dairy. Yeah, my name's Brad Bateman, as Scott mentioned. Uh, I do mostly all the feed. So I, I procure the feed uh, along with Lawn Hall. We do the, the diets, uh, all, of, all of the aspects of that, manage the inventories, and uh, Darren is the assistant feed manager, and he helps a lot. Uh, we bring a lot of feed in yeah. every, every year, every day. Uh, you know, some days there's, there's 12, 15 trucks come across the scale, and so it's, it's no small task on these large dairies. And, you know, there's much larger dairies than we are around the country. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun job, and I enjoy it. I love the challenge of trying to figure out how to feed cows better and how to remain profitable in, in the tough dairy climates that we've gone through in the past. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I do. Oh, excellent. Well, looking forward to the conversation this afternoon. Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself and the role you play at the dairy. Well, you know, there was a time where us brothers, we done a little bit of everything. You know, we couldn't afford to hire a lot of help. So we was all involved in everything, the feeding, the breeding, the uh, everything but the milking, really. But uh, we, we have a big farm, but I, I work on the farm with them. We, you know, we, in the harvest, we all have to be there, a part of the harvest. Uh, work with, when we, when we grew the dairy, I'd done all of the buying of the cattle, you know, we traveled. Uh, we went from uh, 1,200 cows to, to uh, 7,000 pretty fast, and we've had to buy a lot of cows over the years when we started the new dairy. Do that, uh, work with the crail management, you know, the dry lots, the, um, we, we all, we all do a lot of things where we have to when we're harvesting, but we're, we're to the point now where we, we all have kids and son-in-laws in the business, and we're passing a lot of the things, the, the daily task on to our, our sons and son-in-laws and, uh, we have another brother, Lance, that was with us that passed away not long ago, and he has two sons in the business, and they're they're working directly with the cows and doing a really good job. And all of our kids are in various areas. I have a son that's in accounting. Jason's son runs the the shop and works on the farm with him. Uh, Brad's son works in the calves. They all have their roles, and they're doing a really good job. Yeah, you know we're. We're excited how they're going to carry the business on because we would hope that our our business would be on go on many generations if possible. Right, absolutely. You know? Yeah, so, I met some of the, uh, the 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 young men that's uh, the kids and 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 they're very bright and intelligent. Oh, yeah. So I think I think the future of the bait, uh, Mesita Dairy is in good hands. Yeah, I think it is too. Yeah. Jason, how about you? So my role on the farm is as a farm. I do the farm and. And the equipment and things like that, but it's it's been so fun to be able to build the farm as we go and expand and do all these things, and we take some pretty marginal farm ground and turn it into some pretty amazing farm ground, and that's been a real fun thing. And to do it with our boys, you know, I got one son in the business, Chance, and it, it, the thing that I love about it is is the challenge and the and what we've been able to do together to build you know, a, a business, you know, I look at when dad started into where we are. It's been pretty fun. It's been a fun journey to work with my dad and, and my brothers and, and, and it's been a challenge to just build and, and keep growing and doing, because if we don't move forward, we're moving backward. Yeah, exactly. I also want to acknowledge that we've got uh, Lon Hall here. Lon uh, is your nutritionist. He came along with you to the uh, virtual farm tour. We're going to have him come in in a little bit. And so we'll introduce him at that time. 
Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit Balchem.com to learn more. You know, all three of you in your opening comments talked about family. And, you know, I think I met you guys first, I think it was probably back in July when we came out to do the interviewing. And, and that was my key takeaway after visiting with you guys. You know, I love the farm, but the thing that struck me most was the family. And, uh, you know, and so I, I love all you guys, but I got to tell you, uh, my favorite is your dad, Wayne. Uh, <laughs> he, he's something else. He, he, he is. He, he really is. You know, I was kind of smitten with him. But and, you know, it, it all started with your father and uh, and your mother. And uh, he's not he's not able to travel here and wasn't able to be with us this week. But we do have a clip that we'd like to share here um, uh, at, at this point in time. I'm Wayne Bateman. I come home one day to my wife and I said, Danny, I'm quitting school and I'm going to get a herd of cows and we're going to dairy and farm. She about was going to kill me, <laughs> but I had this love and this passion and we just, you know, it's one of those where, uh, you know, as a family, you know, we didn't have it all together, but all together we had it all, and that was the only thing that, that really, really mattered. That same principle just really applies to all of us, to everywhere, no matter what we're doing as an organization. It's, you know, if you can do what you like to do, then, you know, it's not really a, a job, it's a pleasure and something you can enjoy and making it something. And so if at the end of the day, my boys are still talking to me and my wife will let me in the house, it's been a wonderful day. You know, one of the comments your dad said in that uh, clip was, as a family, we didn't have it all together but together we had it all. And I thought that was pretty profound. That, that kind of spoke to me. Can you tell us about, you know, tell us about the role of family in the operation? Well, maybe I'll start off. I, the, the thing, the, the huge benefit and blessing of working together as a family is you know that if you've got to run to a kid's soccer game or football game, uh, you have brothers at home that love what they do as much as you do and their passion and their, their drive to work and take care of things, you know that there's gonna be somebody there, somebody there to take care of things and that, that uh, has a passion for the business as much as you do. And that's a, that's a huge advantage because sometimes you don't have that. You, we have great, wonderful employees and, and a lot of them are very dedicated but at the end of the day, um, the buck stops with us. Uh, it, it, it's top-down management. We have to be good. We have to be at our best every day, and we have to instill uh, that confidence and that optimism towards the business and give our employees that hoorah to, to come every day and, and do a great job. And uh, if I leave, then, then I have brothers to check up and to make sure things are happening. So it's, it's a huge advantage. Yeah. You know, Steve, I was talking to you a little bit ago and you made the comment that, uh, you know, everybody, nobody wants to leave. You have the opportunity maybe to start dairies in other parts of the country, but nobody wants to leave. And, and I, I find that interesting. As, as a young man, I left home at 17 years old, went to college and I've never lived back there. And so there's gotta be a satisfaction, right, of, of working with family, being with your kids, being with your father. Can you talk to uh, a little bit about that. Well, like I was telling you earlier, we we live in a place that everybody likes, and all of our kids live there. We have family all around us. We, you know, we all have a, kids that aren't a part of the business, 
and where we're at it, it to us it's about our family you know we 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 have meetings every week when we're not cropping we we meet in the conference room and we talk and we always say you know what there's a lot of really cool places in this country to dairy probably more economical to dairy than where we're at but we love where we live our families around us and we don't want to leave them and nor does any of our kids you know we talk about Kansas you talk about you know the Dakotas or wherever there's a lot of dairymen going to different places and we we talk about those things but really we're where we're at because that's where we want to be because we want to be with family and uh, we don't want to have to travel to go see our kids and yeah. they're within 30 minutes of us where, where any of them live so, yeah makes sense yeah. Jason, how many family members are there um, working there at the dairy, do you know? So, I have one son, Chance. Brad I has him. Th- Chance is a, a fine young man. Yeah, he's he's always the life of the party. Okay. <laughs> and Take after dad? His mom, probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know... And, you know and, mom's going to hear this. Right, right. <laughs> and, and then Brad has one involved, and Steve has a son and a son-in-law. And Lance has two. And so that's what I love about what we do is to see the spark and, and the fire starting to come into these guys and their own ideas and what they should think. And, and, and it, it, it's good for our business. It, it helps us look from different, you know, like you said, the statement that my dad said is so true because, you know, you go build, you go do something. And if you do it on your own without getting inputs, you know, when you got a lot of people's inputs, it, it makes things so much better. The end product, and I, I contribute. It's, it, those are tough conversations a lot of the times, because we're we're all A type personalities. We all want our way, but we've done it long enough that, and that's why I hope the younger day generation can do is, it takes a while, but at the end of the day, you get to the best product, the best idea, and we see it throughout every aspect of our farm. You know, because everyone has input. It's everyone's baby, and we want input. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple of you guys have mentioned uh, Lance already um, and that he has passed away. And so uh, I guess that happened earlier this year. Um, Brad, would you mind talking a little bit about Lance, you know, who he was as a man and his contribution to the dairy? Well, Lance was uh, – <laughs> What you got with Lance is somebody that was just rock solid. They were consistent in in all that he did. He didn't get riled up very often. Uh, you always knew where he stood, and you know sometimes he was a little stubborn, but but at the end of the day, he was so passionate about the farm, and he loved. And that's that's a little bit sad. This is our first harvest corn harvest without him and uh him and i ran the choppers and and it's it's kind of hard that first day i got in the chopper was a little sad that he wasn't there beside me so uh but he was uh he he was uh, really in a lot of ways amazing and and better in a lot of ways than uh than a lot of us and that's that's what made this work really well was everybody has their strengths and weaknesses and his strengths complemented the business really well because he was so focused and dedicated to, um, you know, the accounting part of it and the bookkeeping and and early on the cows, his sons have taken over that role. But yeah, I, I think when I think of Lance, I just think of how, how rock solid and steady he was. Yeah. So Lance isn't um, able here to represent the family today other than in your hearts, but we do have a clip of his son, Caleb, and I'd like to play that now for us as well. My name is Caleb Bateman. Um, On this farm, I'm a third generation dairyman, but really my family's been milking cows since the beginning of time. The hard thing about coming into an existing business is you always have to contribute. Um, And it's hard coming into a large operation and contributing because when my dad and his brothers came here, with my grandpa, they, they brought a small handful of cows. Um, when they took over, a small handful of cows and they just grew it astronomically. So my generation were really motivated to do the same. We got started in beef cows, similar to any dairy. Um, you always have a byproduct of meat. Um, and we kind of started dabbling in, in crossbreeding. Um, 
our lower end stock to a beef cross. And that's how we got into it. And we started producing an Angus Jersey and an Angus Holstein cross, as well as a Holstein Wagyu cross. Um, we produce 40 to 100 beef calves a week. And we try to push as many of those through our own uh, market. And what we don't and what we're not able to, we ship to uh, JBS. Masita Market's always existed in our hearts. <laughs> it's just one of those things that sell beef to neighbors, you know, people you know around here. Um, it was about five years ago, we're looking for another revenue source. Um, and we, you know, we talked about beef, it's a byproduct. We make money with milk, meat, manure. Let's look at beef and kind of push into there. And so this concept started of, you know, we want to do uh, box beef like every other box beef company. We have a great story to tell because from start to finish, we are in control of the animal. It was about four years ago that we started in now we have three different uh, retail locations and it's been a great thing for us because I mean the, the upside potential there is just it's unbelievable you know I in the in the world today people want to know where their food comes from they want to make sure that it's safe which we all know as agricultural producers that it is but here we have a distinct advantage because we can bring people to our farm you could you could let them write the name they want on the ear tag of that calf because we're going to grow it here and it's going to be under my control here the whole time. Caleb's obviously a bright young man and the uh, future of the dairy is in good hands and then he represents uh, Lance and his side of the family very well. I'd like to now talk a little bit about the timeline, right? This all started with uh, your dad and uh, so what's taken place between the, the, the day where your dad went to um, uh, your mother and he said, honey, I'm, I'm quitting school and I'm gonna, got, I'm gonna buy a dairy. <laughs> so what's, what's happened between that day and what's, what's happened uh, now? You wanna start us with that, Steve? Sure. Well, you know, when we, when we uh, moved down, we, we bought the farm in Mesita, the 400 acres, and in 1972. And uh, we had to keep dad back at the farm to run the farm. So he sent me and Brad and my cousin Barry that was older. And I was just, I was just, it was between my, my uh, sophomore and junior year in high school. And Brad's three years younger than me. So it was just kids out there on the desert running 400 acres. He come and helped us get it planted. But uh, we, uh, we got the farm going. And as opportunities came, we added to the farm to where it's, you know, it's a 3,500 acre farm now there. And that first farm that we've, we've bought and put together is really doing well. And we've, we've added a lot of ground since then, but when we, were, when we were just young married, we were signing on the dotted line, putting everything we had at stake to buy farms, you know, and as they come for sale and available. And, and so we, dad was always one. He always wanted us to stay on the technology. You know, if, you don't, if you're not growing and you're not keeping abreast of the technology, you're not gonna progress. So we always went to Tulare Farm Show. That was one of our outings. And we'd go down and see what's going on in the business, the new technology and everything. He was always wanting us to grow. And so we just, and we've done that. We've, we've used an embraced technology where it's made us better. And uh, I, I think that the kids, you know, they're even, you know, the next generation. That technology is their thing. And, and uh, that they'll take us in that direction still, continuing. Yeah. But, you know, I saw some pictures of your dad uh, in his younger years. You look a lot like him. Has anybody ever said that before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brad, um, can you add some of the timeline there, uh, kind of flesh that out for us a little more? Well, uh, you know, like Steve said, we, we took advantage of opportunities as they came our way. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I don't know that we had... A, a direct plan to really, uh, you know, grow as much as we did. It's I, I always joke and I say it's just the man plan. The the man, <laughs> the man plan is you make it up and figure it out as you go. <laughs> but those opportunities have uh, have came along and and uh, the the timeline from where we started and where we end or, or where we're at today, not where we ended, but. Uh, today is, has been an amazing journey and, and a lot of that is just by taking advantage of opportunities, seeing needs that, uh, that 
that we need to we needed more farm ground one we needed to milk more cows uh, especially as the next generation as they uh, as they come into the business we we've, we've got to be a little bit bigger and uh, you know have have more resources and things for them to do and to help out with and to grow the business and like Steve said I'm I'm really proud of all of them they're doing a great job and in their own areas they're they're so dedicated and, and good and in a lot of ways they're way better than we were at, at that age <clears throat> they've all got college degrees they're better educated they're they're better looking they're just they're, <laughs> You married well. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good bunch of kids, and I'm really excited for their future. And as we transition into a different phase, uh, more of an oversight, maybe a leadership role as we stand back and let them run, um, they'll be fine. They'll do great. Yeah. Yeah. Can I'm you excited. guys kind of give us an overview of what the dairy looks like today? You know, uh, cropland. Uh, how you're irrigating it, uh, number of cows, uh, who wants to start with that? I can start with that. So, you know, as, as you guys have been talking here, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I think we're at the place we were 20 years ago, 21 years ago when we built the hillside dairy. I feel that we're to that point again, we got these boys that want in, and dairy's a great life. I think it, it's it's great for us. It's something you can't go just start on your own anymore. And I think we're to the point where it's time to do it again. It, it's opportunities. We've always been opportunistic as as things change. But I think it's it's. I'm feeling that again. It's time to make the next step. Is that is that five thousand more? Is that what is that going to look like? The meat business. You know that's a whole new twist on things. And and I think there's so many opportunities that's what's fun is we get everyone's running with ideas and thinking of ways to build the business but it, it's that's been fun and exciting but you just look back as we had at our open house he was there we had our, our that was the first tractor we had on that farm and it was still there and to see how the technology has changed over these years it it there's three things in life that's never gone down in, in price. It's a Ford truck, a John Deere tractor, and a yard of concrete. And so we're getting really concerned because these are getting really expensive. And if we don't farm more land, we need more farmland for our cattle. We need more dairy for family. So I'm excited. I think the future's bright. Yeah, and do you have a feel for where that, is that future gonna stay in Utah? You know, that's for the next generation to decide, yeah. you know, they you come out here and you see all the corn and all the no pivots and all these, and you go home and our grass died three or four months ago, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. So you yeah. mentioned Mesita markets, uh, as, as one of the expansions to your business, one of the additions to it, who would like to kind of talk, give us an overview of what the Mesita markets is. Well, well, if you, if you think about it, our main business is milk, second meat, third manure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're all commodities that come off the farm. We use the manure back on the farm. Um, the milk goes to DFA, Dairy Farmers of America. They distribute it wherever it needs. Um, the meat is a resource that we felt we needed to tap into because it's so much of what we do. And, and we got to a point where we have kill plants that have disappeared because of uh, urban growth, apartment buildings, things like that. And where we used to take a lot of our cows, we had to do something. And we've heard a lot of other dairymen say, we all ought to partner and get together and do something. Well, we had an opportunity with some a place that we was already marketing meat through and uh, two brothers and we, we had the chance, it's been two years come December, that we purchased Mosita Market. My son-in-law is running that business now and uh, it, it's been good for us. We're, we're in the process of looking at the opportunity to, to uh, take a building that we have and turn it into another processing plant and uh, because we need to grow it because we're getting to the point where we have to go so far to haul our animals to market that if we could take the, uh, the cold cows and, and turn that part of the business, take it in hand and 
and the fats also. But uh, we're, we're just trying to use our resources and you know, you never know. We're, we're in the trucking business. We have a equipment company, you know, and uh, where we have to grow to keep things moving forward, we will. You know, that's, and, the, and our kids have that vision too. And, and in our meetings, we, do, we have meetings where we brainstorm and talk about things that we could do in the future. That's one of the fun things is that the kids will have a little bit of a different vision than we will maybe. You know, we've brought it this far. It's going to be cool to see where our kids want to take it. Yeah. And we hope it, does, we hope it goes into our grandkids, great-grandkids, you know. Now, you mentioned uh, uh, the Mesita Market and moving your own cattle through there. You also have a beef cattle operation. Who runs that for you? That's what Caleb That's does. That's what Caleb yeah. does. Okay. And his, his brother, Preston, we haven't mentioned much about him, but he's kind of the one that heads up the, the cows, you know, the yeah. dairy. He, he runs the dairy and does an awful good job. And Caleb's, Caleb's over the beef right now. Okay. And what percent of the uh, uh, beef cattle go through your market? And then how do you market the, the, the rest? You know, we're, we're a small percent. They, that's why we've got to put a new facility in because we've got to, we've got to take it into hand to market as many as we can through because there's um, those that we send, that we just send off to a, to a JBS or wherever. We, we send a semi load about every other week and sometimes every week, depending on where we're at, to JBS fat cattle. Uh, we just know that it would benefit our business better if we could market them ourselves, yeah. and that is growing. Yeah, you know, uh, if we if we put a plan in, you know, we're doing we're doing probably thirty a week. If we build a plant, we'd do it for fifty a day. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and throw a lot of room there for growth, so that we because you know we have twenty thousand animals on the farm, and uh, we're in the milk meat and our business. Right. And I think it's important to note that the, the 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 cattle that you're feeding there is actually beef on dairy, so they're on your own dairy, your right. own dairy cattle. Right. On the own. Yep. Yep. And, and the interesting thing that that, that I found is um, using the Charlay on the jerseys. You know, yeah. my my first job out of college, um, I was doing nutrition work for a a jersey producer, and. Uh, uh, I had read somewhere that Jersey meat was the most tender and most flavorful meat that there is. So I got the idea that I'd work with this gentleman and we would feed out these Jersey calves and market them. And that lasted about two rounds, I think, because those, those guys didn't grow very fast. You know? <laughs> and they didn't get very big. But those calves that you bred to Charlay, those look like beef cattle. I was very impressed they, with they that. They do, and they grow just as fast as the uh, Holstein Angus Cross. We've done a trial. We done a trial with them, and and they went right head to head. On some of the trials, the Charlay gained a little bit more, but uh, you know, and we're we're crossing Angus Holstein, Holstein uh, Wagyu, and uh, Jersey and Charlay. Okay. And we backed off on the Jersey Charlay. We're trying to get it headed in the direction where we try to get more focused and and keep it into you know like the Angus and the Charlay now. That's okay. kind of where we're going with it. And the Wagyu, do you anticipate uh, expanding that? Are you going to oh, yeah. keep that where that's at? It's working. That's kind of our flagship meat that we sell in the store. Okay. We, we hand pick them. Those are the ones that if you go in there and want to get a ribeye or a, you know, a New York or whatever, that we can consistently pick them and get really good steaks. And, and it's growing. Yeah. The business is growing. Yeah. You anticipate expanding your, your beef operations or will it expand as the dairy expands? We would like to get to the point where, uh, you know, instead of, like I say, just sending them off to a, to someone else to market them, and we want to do it ourselves. So we're just going to grow it as we can Yeah, yeah. As, it, as it allows us to do it, you yeah. know. Good stuff. You know, one of the things that I was impressed with was the robotic uh, barn that you guys recently put in. I think it's um, built to hold, what, 800 head, and you got 600 so heads in there. Uh, can you guys kind of, uh, who would like to talk about you know, how that came about, the process that you went through in, in deciding to put a robotic uh, uh, dairy on the, on the farm. Yeah, I can, I can talk about that. I, you know, everybody has their version of how we came to make that decision, but uh, many conversations of uh, just being short, short of labor. And can, can robots, uh, can they work, especially on larger scale? And and so we we traveled around, we looked at a lot, and, and the more we looked at them, I, I was impressed. But uh, still we needed to prove that it could work and we could make it work. 
we've been about six months uh, now milking in that in that facility, and it's it's uh, right now it's working really well. We've got the bugs worked out. Cows love it. They're uh, the, the stress level for those cows in that in that barn are so much less. There's nobody coming three times a day to move them and push them and get them get them here and and there and uh, we uh, we sort them we sort them and lock them to breed them and treat them and take care of them. The the turnover rate there is considerably lower than at the big dairy. Somatic cell counts are lower. All of those all of those good things. But I think overall. The, the, the decision was based upon can technology uh, replace some labor and uh, can, it, can it work and be profitable? And, and I think there's no doubt it works. The, the overall numbers still need to, need to play out as we continue to fill the barn. We should have the barn full sometime here in the next month or so. And uh, then we'll see how many we can actually milk and push through there. And uh, we, we haven't wanted to take cows from, from the big dairy and make that less, less efficient. So we, we're slowly growing into it. But uh, we, we should have it full here, like I say, probably in, in November, December. And looking forward to, to that and then really uh, drilling down into the numbers and seeing what they look like and, and make a decision from there whether that's the direction we continue or we go with other technology that, that may be a, a rotary parlor or something different as, as we consider growth and, and uh, moving forward. Yeah. So when you say looking at the numbers, you're talking about the, the, the capital investment in the... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the cost, the cost is, is high, there's no doubt. Uh, you know, even the robot companies admit that it's it's too too much, it's too high. Uh, we'll see where that ends up. Technology, as more uh, generally, the early adopters pay a higher price. Uh, as that technology uh, becomes more prevalent, and there's there's better ways to manufacture, and and the volume grows, I would think that we could maybe even see a softening in the price of robots. I think they definitely need to be, uh, to be viable. You, you look at the cost of really any project today and, and it's, uh, it's astronomical. The, the cost of everything, steel, cement, everything continues to, to go up and stay up and uh, it's, it, it makes it more difficult to find a good uh, ROI on, on some of these projects. So. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, is that the only downside to the technology that you've identified so far? Uh, you know, working the bugs out early was was a little bit of a challenge, like everything. All these projects, even when we started in our big barn, we had lots of little bugs to work out. But uh, now that it's working, it's working great. And uh, I, I would say maybe the the only barriers there might be the overall cost of the project per cow to make it work. It's it's a high it's a higher cost than anything else out there, no doubt. Yeah. But you're prepaying for some of your labor. But what we're finding also is some of that labor is technical, and so the cost of technical labor is is a little higher. And uh, so that, these are all the things that we need to really prove and flush out and uh, see where see where everything ends up. Yeah. Yeah, the interesting thing that I found in one of your comments today was it allows you to incrementally grow, whereas maybe you won't have a market for, you know, a milk from 5,000 cows, but this will, as you find markets, you can you can add more robots and more cows. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yeah. So I was going to ask you a little bit about uh, what role you see for robots in the future. My, my guess is you're going to say it depends. You've got some evaluation to do. It depends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it depends on several things, yeah. Uh, again, those costs uh, are, are going to be key as to to what those robot projects are. But you know, here today at World Dairy Expo, I've talked to two different people. Uh, one in Slovenia, and uh, he has one robot. He put in one D. Laval robot in Slovenia to milk his 70 cows, and uh, he thinks he's died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He, and he can come to a show like yeah, this. Yeah, he can come to a show because the robots are helping yeah. the cows. <laughs> that's that's where I really see the advantage around the world. And, and as you see, you know, even in uh, places in the world where 
I, I've never thought of a dairy industry in Sylvania, but uh, it was interesting to talk to that guy and, and hear his, his uh, slant on those problems that he has there in Slovenia, and they're similar to us, but a, but a robot is solving some of those problems of labor, and we think we have labor issues here. There's labor issues all around the world, really. Yeah. You know, I'd like to kind of dig into the research aspect of the uh, robotic farm. Uh, I'm going to wait until we get Lon here, and maybe uh, he's got some input on that. We'll bring him in here a little bit later. But one thing I kind of want to dig into now is is the consumer, and they're beginning to have demands that perhaps they didn't have before, right, when it comes to sustainability or animal welfare. And, uh, you know, I know part of your philosophy that I saw today is that uh, if you take care of the cow, well, they'll take care of you. And so uh, who would like to talk a little bit about what does that mean? And, and then where did that come from? Who came up with that? Who did come up with that? Was that dad? Or well, I thought it was grandma. Yeah. Well, I, I know I can give you <laughs> yeah, a little history of, of, our, of our family, you know, which was talked about before. My grandma was out there all the time. I remember when, when we was kids, my grandpa took care of the calves. Uh, a lot of people milked cows because back then you didn't hire a lot of that done in small farms. When I was a kid, it was only milking 130 cows. But I remember going out many times or not being out there and my grandma saying, you need to go kick the hay up to the cows. You know, she says, if you, you know, if you take care of the cows, really, I don't know, did that come from grandma? That's what I thought. Yeah. But she was the one that was always on us kids, you know, to make when we were just young kids, little kids, and she would, we would, we would go out and we'd clean the stalls. We all had jobs on the farm. We would, we would rake the stalls and we'd go out. And she always said, no matter where you're at out there, make sure they got feed, make sure it's pushed up, tear them, take care of them. And she loved the cows. My, you know, my grandpa, you know, I, I know that he would go out and he would take care of the animals. Grandma would milk the cows in the morning. And I know that she, many times I've been told that she milked 14 cows a day by hand. While Grandpa was out taking the cows and getting ready to do farm work, she have and a then firm she, handshake, huh? She have a firm handshake. Oh, Gra yeah. Grandma had tough oh, hands. Oh yeah, yeah she was. <laughs> she was. She, and she was so awesome with us because she, she was out there in the farmyard all the time. It seemed like she was out there. I remember squirting the water on to keep the dust down in the yard in front of the milk barn. You know, in the olden days, and it was a little different then. Now, yeah. you know, our our farm is, is bigger and faster moving and. You know, to be able to have those memories of your grandparents teaching you how important it is to take care of the animals and to work hard and, and you know, we say that we're in the milk, meat, and manure business, but we're really in the family business. Right. That's going to say that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We're in the people business. In the people business. Yeah, we really are. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of employees and, you know, we have about 110 employees or so on. And their families are depending on our farm being a success. Right. And we take great pride in the employees that we have. So some of those employees have worked from when we went to Mesita. Like Paulo showed up on the scene like a year or two after we moved to Mesita. Back and, in the 70s? And he, re he just retired. Wow. He comes and helps breed on Thursday. But his sons have worked for us. And, and these people are like family to us. Yeah, he, he was my age when he came to the farm. And... He was just a young kid, and uh, it's, you know, now he lives in the town with his family. Well, his kids are all raised, too, but he's kind of like family to us. Good guy. Good yeah. stuff. So how does the philosophy of taking care of the cow and they'll take care of you, how does that uh, manifest itself on the dairy today with how you take care of the cows, how you take care of the calves, uh, the facilities, those kinds of things? Well, I, I think uh, th there's probably for sure not a week goes by where in some employee training, um, uh, part of, of what we do there where we talk about, now this is what's best for you, but it might not be best for what, it might not be the best for the cow. Right. And we talk about that uh, to the employees all the time when we walk through it when you look at some of those protocols and some of the things that we do day to day, whether it's calf care or, um, you know, heifer raising or milking, what uh, there's all those procedures and protocols that we do every day. And sometimes there's some drift and we always have to go back and say, okay, now this is what's best for the cow. That means it's best for you. 
because we all have a job because of these cows. And uh, it, it really rings true. They, they understand that. When you start talking about it in terms of what that means to them, really taking care of the cow. You know, I'm sure that uh, taking care of the cows also, making sure they get the uh, appropriate nutrition. And, and, and that's my cue to bring in uh, uh, Lon Hall. Well, Lon, welcome. It's good to see you here again. Uh, great job today, by the way, at the virtual uh, farm tour. Why don't you kind of uh, give us all uh, an overview of who Lon Hall is and, and what do you do for Mesita Dairy? Okay, my, like, my name is Lon Hall. I'm a nutritionist. I work with uh, Bateman Mesita Farms and uh, have, have done for quite a a number of years um, and yeah I'm a dairy nutritionist I went to the University of Arizona and Utah State for my degrees and currently live in Arizona very well can you kind of give us some background on what your nutritional philosophies are and maybe you start with the uh, transition cows and then uh, talk a little bit about lactating cows yeah so the nutritional philosophy is basically it, it varies from place to place but it is to find what the dairy has, what feeds, what, what uh, management style, and, and build the nutritional program that benefits those, that approach, those cows. Um, so the philosophy does depend on management. There's a very strong nutrition management interaction. Um, but, but yeah, and on transition cows, we try to get them to where when they freshen, they don't have a huge difference to overcome in the composition of the diet. We found cows come in fresh and better, milk better, and uh, having those essential nutrients delivered to them like choline has, has been a important part of that process. Yeah, you, you were telling me before too as well that, that maybe your philosophy is a little more aggressive than most people, right? And you're not using a lot of straw, maybe not using the Goldilocks, but again, back to making sure those cows are ready to, to milk at their peak when they're done. Right, yeah. and a lot of that is experience Batemans have had uh, trying the, the diets that are more typical back east that just have not resulted in the peaks that we typically, we like to see. Yeah. Now talking about the transition period, right, we, we kind of talk about it as one period, but it's two very distinct periods, right? The animal has two distinctly different needs. So how do you manage that close-up cow, far-off cow versus that fresh cow? And what are some of the nutritional needs that you're, you're paying a lot of attention to, especially in that fresh cow? Yeah, so to go back, they are, they're two completely different diets. Um, one of them we're telling that we're almost limiting intake with a negative DCAT approach and the close-ups, uh, yet we want them to just take off running. And so there's differences. One we're trying, we're, is almost acidifying it a little bit, and the other one tends to be a more basic ration, uh, try to regulate room and pH. And uh, so they are fundamentally different but on the same token, we want as few changes as possible. We want, we don't want them going from a 10% starch diet to a 26% starch diet overnight. Um, we want to make sure that there's good biological, bio, biologically available calcium when they freshen, so they can utilize that um, and take off running. They have very high demands with energy and with calcium as they as they freshen and climb that peak. What about amino acids? Do you pay special attention to trying to fortify with amino acids during that period of time because their their intake is low? Or I guess if you do that, you got to take something else out. It's I guess it's always a balance, right? It is. And so it's amino acids, but it's also metabolizable protein. So we have, we have yeah. goals for metabolizable protein. And that's where a little more energy dense diet works. You can get that MP. And then we do, we, we target specifically lysine, methionine, but we've also looked at uh, histidine and some of the other branch chain amino acids, just making sure of that MP we're getting getting what we need and part of it is a work in progress. Yeah. You know, I think the last time we talked when we were out there in Utah, you said that um, that you've been using Reassure at that dairy, uh, maybe it's a better question for, for Brad, but for over a decade. And I'm just kind of curious is how did you come to the decision to start using Reassure in your in your diets? Well, you know, Lon mentioned a decade. It's it's been longer than that, I think. I, it all it's all a blur. But it, we uh, through the time that we were feeding or not feeding, but um, involved with our RBST, uh, we saw great gains in production, 
and actually had thin cows uh, through some of that period until we adapted and, and overcame some of those uh, net negative energy issues. As, as we transitioned into a better feeding um, philosophy, uh, we, we got a little bit of gain on those cows. But then, as we were uh, asked to go off it, uh, we saw fat cows, and <laughs> a lot of them. And fatty liver syndrome and some of those issues that we were suffering, we started to lose a bunch of cows. And uh, I, at that time, I was not as, uh, I guess, as knowledgeable as I should have been. And, and somebody said, well, what about choline? You know, what about reassure? And so we brought it in. We saw immediate change. We, we saw immediate results. It was. And what was, were those results? It was wonderful. Well, we stopped having those fatty liver syndromes. Got it. And those cows transitioned on through without uh, crashing and burning. And, and so right then and there, we thought, hey, this is, a, this is a product that we need to incorporate into our everyday feeding uh, regiments. And so, so we did. And it, that's been quite a while ago. Yeah, maybe 15 more years. I don't know. Okay. So that's when we were first, uh, uh, first came to, to know that product. So. You know, it's been thanks the, to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been on the market about 22 years now, and you mentioned fatty liver. And when we first introduced it back then, uh, it was it was really introduced as a treatment for fatty liver. Since that time, additional research trying to understand the impact of choline on dairy cow biology, and during and through the 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 the, the process of, of uh, the research, we found that you know. It has uh, benefits far beyond just fatty liver, but in fact, uh, we're able to provide a smoother transition. I think that's partly due to reducing fat in the liver mm -hmm. and ketones that's, that's floating through the body. But we also found that um, we were able to get cows to be able to peak higher and maintain that milk production throughout the entire lactation. There's been uh, a meta-analysis done. It showed about a four pound increase every day. Uh, over the entire lactation. And then some more recent research that we've done is done with uh, in utero uh, programming uh, and by feeding the, 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 the dam, the calves that are subsequently born are healthier, able to fight off disease better, and they'll grow about a tenth of a pound uh, per head a day more. So uh, we continue to invest and uh, got excited to share three new research studies, uh, one from uh, University of Florida, one from Wisconsin, and uh, one from Michigan State. Choline's kind of gotten a rap of being for problem cows. Those three data uh, research points to the fact that high producing cows and cows that have very smooth transitions already also benefit from choline. So anyway, I didn't want to go to a commercial, but I guess I did. But anyway, <laughs> we, we do have to pay some bills here. <laughs> well, and, and uh... You know, I would agree. We've uh, we've incorporated into our our everyday, uh, you know, close up fresh cow transition, and we we're seeing amazing peaks it, in our robot barn. We have some cows that are, you know, four days in milk, giving 125 pounds of milk, and uh, you know, cows peaking over 200 pounds of, of milk a day. It's just it's it's phenomenal. It, it's almost unbelievable to a certain degree to think of, of what these animals can do. And, uh, you know, when the genetics are there and everything falls in line, it, it's really amazing. Yeah, I can remember 10, 15 years ago saying, well, looking at that line of how cows keep producing more and more every year and like, how, can we, how long can we keep doing this? It keeps going. So I have no idea, I'm not gonna predict anymore. Yeah. Uh, Lon, while I've got you here, wanted to talk one a little bit to you about the research facility there at the robotic farm and uh, how you see using that as a nutritionist. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there, there's tremendous opportunity there. I mean, even with this choline story, we know fresh cows mobilize a, a, a large amount of, of fatty acids and just keeping that liver functioning, we don't want to eliminate ketosis. We want to have it at an optimal level so that cows perform well. So what this lab does, it allows us to not just take a shoot side test in this area, but we can actually pull blood samples, get serum, and measure beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, as we talked about earlier, it's also 
a unique ability to have the precision and accuracy of a university and the reality of a dairy. Um, we can have large numbers of experimental units. Um, it, that, that leveled, so not only to test new products and see how they work and see if those, those results are repeatable, but also on farm to say, here's what we're seeing. Let's see if we can unlock why these cows under these weather conditions are in, are in this predicament and solve our problems quicker. Now, are you going to be uh, pursuing research projects that you and the team have identified that you want to understand, you know, whether it's in a different management practice, different nutrient or something, or do you see yourself contracting that out to um, uh, other companies that may want to do research there? Well, and that's ultimately up to the Batemans, but that, that is one of the things is, is how can it best benefit the Bateman we'll see the farm? Yeah. Um, and I think there's opportunity for both some of the basic questions and some of the applied questions, but also having the ability to to get measurable results with accuracy that is, I, as far as I know, found nowhere else in the industry, yeah. right, right there on the farm. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah and I think there's a lot of uh, questions that we have as to not only ingredients and uh, feeding scenarios, but I think it goes beyond that, but there's a lot of information that we can gain for ourselves to make us better. <clears throat> we will look outside for some of that uh, to, to, to bring money in uh, to, to keep it sustainable, but uh, at, at the end of the day, a lot of that information is going to benefit us uh, as we dial in and, and drill down to what really makes sense for us as we go into some of these trials and tests and look at different ingredients that we may consider. And so that's the exciting part. That's really exciting to think about what we could do with all of that. And so it's, yeah, it's really exciting. I think even on the farm side of things, if we can be running some, we farm, you know, we do a lot of BMR and different forages, but in our three-way blends and in these things, if we can, because in that robot barn, in that controlled environment, which we don't have at the other dairy, then we can start saying, you know, this corn, this hybrid is giving us this result, starch, you know, digestibility of the, of the starch and all these new things. I think if we can drill down it could really change the bottom line. And this lab's gonna allow us to do some of that. I'm pretty excited about that part of it. Excellent. Uh, Lon, anything else you'd like to share with us uh, relative to the nutritional programs there at uh, Mesita Dairy uh, before we bring Steve back in? Uh, just just in, uh, in agreement with uh, what Jason said, just also being able to get real-time results on the crops, yeah. knowing when the optimal time to harvest is, when to get the best starch digestibility, best yields, and then translating that into the cows. Um, yeah, but that's good. good. Well, so, thanks for joining us. Thank you. You know, we were talking just a little bit about uh, animal welfare. Let's talk a little bit about human welfare and your workers and some of the dynamics that go into the fact that you're in a pretty competitive labor market. Uh, who wants to talk about some of those dynamics? Uh, yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, it, you know, back to our motto, Scott, if we take care of the cows, they'll take care of us. It, it's the same with our employees. Right. If we take care of our employees, they'll, they'll take care of us. They'll, they'll work hard. And anything that we can do to make their job easier and better, and we talk a lot about technology and, and some of the modern advances that may be coming out, whether it be equipment or machinery or, or whatever, um, anything that we can do to make them better and to be better is, is money well spent. We, we live in a very competitive labor market, uh, construction. A any of these guys can, can make more money uh, by leaving us and going to construction. A lot of them love what they do. They love, they love working on the farm, working with the calves and the livestock and, and so forth. But at the end of the day, we have to be competitive. <clears throat> and we offer housing and we do a, a few other things. We have fun uh, Christmas parties and you know other things throughout the year and, and they appreciate that. And that, that's really one of the most important things we can do is uh, 
understand what they truly need. Uh, sometimes it's not money. Sometimes it's other it's other issues. It might be medical things. It may be um, more time with their families. And so we try to be very, very uh, receptive and open uh, to our employees as individuals and what their individual needs are. And uh, that, that's probably one of the most important things that we can can do as leadership and that we can also instill in our uh, in our kids is, uh, you know, truly listen and, and, and hear what's being said and what's going on as, as we think about our employees. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking before that the consumer has many expectations of us. One is, you know, high quality product, uh, treating our animals correctly, treating our, our employees uh, with respect, uh, paying them well. And, and another thing I think they expect from us is they expect us to be good stewards of the environment. And so I'd like to talk to you, Jason. Tell us a little bit about some of the, the, the practices you guys have put in place to, to uh, protect the environment. Yes, thank you. That's a great question. You know, on our farm, we, you know, we adopt the technology. And so by auto steering and all this technology thing, we're literally saving hours and, and, and like it's 12% on our chemical bill by adopting RTK sub-inch accuracy with the satellites, with the tractors, with the sprayers, and all of this equipment. And, and this equipment is so expensive and the fuel is so expensive now, every hour matters. But, and, and we use a lot of, uh, of genetically modified corn on our farm. And so the, cause because we want this to be a, a viable business for our grandkids and our great grandkids and things. And so we take it very personal that we want this land to be better than when we showed up. When we're gone, when I'm gone, I want my kids to be, this farm to be better. And so by doing what we're doing, the water safer, the wildlife safer, um, we're getting by with less, less of those things. And, and so we, we double crop on our farm, like we said in the presentation, but, but the soil health, you know, we use way less fertilizer than we did five years ago, way less fertilizer, because we're focusing on soil health. And, and, and we have some pretty tough dirt and some pretty tough water, but we've made great strides in that. And so we work very hard at recycling our water, our sand, our bedding, our fertilizer and you move it using more compost and, and those kind of things has moved the farm and, and so we're pretty excited that our goal, my goal before I I move on is fifty tons of feed off of every acre. We're three ton away from that right now. And so we're pretty excited. We're gonna be able to achieve this goal and it comes back to to all of these things and the people, you know, we have a great agronomy team and 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 we just always trying and doing different things and that's the fun of it you know is seeing can we actually do that we've had you know this double cropping thing because we haven't had a hay farm we haven't had a hay field on our farm for 13 years now some of these have been corn on corn for 29 years 28 years and to see the soil and the crops getting better it's, it's very um, satisfying that we are doing the right thing because we've done the wrong thing for a long time. And, and it's, took, it's took a lot of these school of hard knocks to figure out the process. And, and we're pretty excited what the future holds. Yeah, you know, Brad was talking that he's, he was driving around yesterday kind of envious of the soil that they've got here in Wisconsin. But it sounds like you guys are doing pretty well building up the soil back there in Utah. So uh, I applaud you for that. Nice, Thank you. nice job. Gentlemen, this has been, uh, this has been a real treat. I've enjoyed every minute of it as we just talked. I, I, I don't want to stop, but I guess uh, I've gotten the high sign that we will stop. Uh, one thing I'd like to do before we leave is uh, half for each of you guys talk about success. Uh, you've obviously been successful as, as, as men, as fathers, as, as dairymen. What kind of advice would you give to uh, other dairymen out there that, that's listening to this? Um, how do you build uh a successful life and a successful dairy. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen. 
NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash NitroSure. And uh, Jason, let's start. Sure. You know what? I think if we enjoy what we do, you know, it's like Chance said the other day, sh I should pay you to do this. He gets up at 3 in the morning and starts playing. We're running 24 hours a day. And he says, I should pay you. And I said, exactly. You should pay us because this is pretty fun. And I think, you know, working with family, we worked with my dad forever. And that's the reward. And, and my take to the kids, we tell them all the time, how much is enough money? Because money ain't going to make us happy. You know, it helps. We got to be successful. We got to pay the bills. We want to build the business. But when we're gone, you know, that ain't going with us. So hopefully we can have a lot of fun along the way and, and build a legacy that can go on, you know, what my dad, my mom started. Yeah. Hopefully that can go on. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. Appreciate that. Steve, I'm going to toss the ball to you. <laughs> You know, I, I had a friend that come and got on, he, he come out to the farm and he's from a farm family and uh, their family isn't all together on the farm anymore. And he was out one day at the farm to see the robot dairy. And he says, when you're harvesting, will you call me and let me know when you're harvesting? So I called him the other day. He come and climbed on with on me with the tractor pushing pit, you know, when we're packing corn silage. We're doing the harvest now. And uh, I took him over and let him ride with Brad on the chopper for a while. I took him up and we had to load a load of cattle. And he was with me for two hours. He says, when he left to me, he shook my hand and he said, Steve, what an awesome thing you're doing here with your family. And I said, you know, we really enjoy it. He said, I just got back from Ireland for two weeks with my wife. And he said, I had more fun here in two hours than I had in two weeks in Ireland. And it, it's, you know, you've, you've got to like what you're doing. And we enjoy what we're doing out there. We, we want our kids to continue it. And I guess my advice is, I, I hear, you know, as we travel around the country and see other dairymen and stuff, a lot of dairymen don't have somebody to succeed them and keep, carry their family heritage on. You know, their kids have moved off and went somewhere. Make it possible for your kids. Start young. Have a plan to get them in the business early on and keep them there because we're losing it. Yeah. You know, we're losing the farmers of the country. And uh, that's what I would say. We, we, my dad done everything he could do, my dad and my mom, to keep us in the business. We're doing everything we can to keep our kids in the business, and I hope our kids will bring the grandkids in. That's my advice. Oh, yeah. if, if your family's doing something together, there's there's a real synergy in the yeah, great energy, answer. synergy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate yeah. that. Brad, final words. Can you top that? Well, the, you know, the question you asked that led up to this was, uh, what advice would you give to other dairymen? Well, I, you know, the advice that I would give to others, and, and more specifically, uh, our sons, as as they bring, uh, come in and and bring that next generation, um, would would be to not sweat the small stuff, not to get caught up in some of those little daily disasters and problems, and uh, to see the bigger picture because dar dairying is frustrating. There's always something broken, broken, breaking down. There's uh, employees that aren't showing up and, and sometimes I know uh, it's stressful. But to take things in stride, look at the big picture, take it day by day and, and enjoy it because it's, it's, a great, it's a great way of life and, it's, and it can be a great business. If it's ran as a business, it can be a great business and a great way of life. Yeah. And to be able to work with the cows and family in the land, what a, what a blessing. What a, what a wonderful opportunity we've had. And uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah. Well, I thank you for that, guys. Listen, I want to thank you guys for joining me this afternoon. This has been, this has been a real treat. It's been fun. Yeah, it has. Thank and you. So, it's been thank great. You. you know, and I'd also like to thank our loyal listeners for joining us once again. I. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you learned as much as I did. And I hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. 
Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.